For us to come to a, an inspiration that we might totally radically change our consciousness, we have to encounter someone in some way, either through literature, through meeting a physical person, which is the best way. We have to encounter someone who we think has a different kind of consciousness. Something about the way they are, the way they behave. Actually, everybody has a slightly different thing. And there are many more enlightened people around us than we will recognize normally, most of us. But, you know, sometimes, like, people meet the Dalai Lama, for example, and they get pretty weaked out. <laughs> Apparently, when people met Buddha, they really flipped out. Because Buddha was like the Dalai Lama. I think, the Dalai, I personally think the Dalai Lama is quite like the Buddha. But our time is different. And if the Dalai Lama had a huge long ear like Dumbo the elephant, <laughs> and had like a weird tuft of white hair in the middle of his forehead, radiating light rays all over the place, and had like a big extra dome on top of his head with a column of light always shooting up straight up above it, and had webbed fingers and webbed toes, not to mention some other, all kinds of other signs on his body, he might be dissected like they were trying to do to E.T. You know, in our world, the, the CIA Homeland Security would get a hold of him and like try to figure out what's he got going for himself. So he has to look more normal, you know. Whereas the Buddha was a walking special effect machine. No, he was. Like his first lay disciple, I love that story. He was, uh, he was sitting with his monks in the, in the grove, you know, where they used to spend the night in some grove. You know, some donor's grove where the monks would be allowed to stay, you know, which would eventually became a monastery and university. But initially they lived in these groves. And there was a young yuppie who, with a bunch of friends, had been out partying, you know, and they'd been rolled by some call girl some ancient Indian cold girls. And they only had like their like jock straps, you know, like their dhoti. These were these young Indian like princely types with jewels and hairdo and really fancy. And he was and he'd been drugged, of course. They had drugged and rolled them. So he was stinking of alcohol and he was groggy and drugged. And he was rushing through the woods angrily. And he saw this monk there and he said, Did you see some girls? with some jewels and clothes and silk clothes and things. And he's like shouting at the Buddha. And the Buddha looks up at him and says, do you really want your clothes and your jewels and your American Express card and those girls? Or would you like to take Nirvana? And the guy says, oh, Nirvana, of course. <laughs> Bam, sits down. And in 17 hours, he was a saint. <laughs> he attained Nirvana. And the Buddha even did a weird thing because after about 12 hours, his parents came rushing out, the local banker, you know, merchants, you know, he was what they called Setiputta, you know, he was like a yuppie. <laughs> and middle class sort of merchant type. The merchants particularly liked the Buddhists, you know. And uh, they said, well, where's our boy, Yashas? You know, where's our boy? And he was sitting right there meditating. The Buddha put a screen of invisibility around him so the parents couldn't see him for another few hours. He said, I'm sure he'll show up. It's okay, don't worry, I think he's okay. And so I my ear is okay. And he was actually right there. But he needed a few more hours before having to tangle with mom and dad <laughs> to achieve realization of selflessness and freedom and wisdom, which apparently he had the ripeness to do. And then when he had achieved that, then the Buddha said, Well, here's your boy. And then his, the son was like, Ding, hi mom and dad, I'm a wife now. <laughs> but he really was. So they were a little disappointed because he couldn't go back and run the shop. He became one of Buddha's monks, you know, because he was like beyond sort of doing that at that stage. You know, it's an early story, in Buddha, but I like it. But what my point is that the Buddha's field around him was such that someone who was hungover, angry, furious, raw, worrying about his American Express card, his jewels, immediately stopped in his tracks, sat down, seeking the higher, higher, the ultimate aim of life. <coughs> You know, salvation, liberation from suffering. That's quite surprising and amazing, I think, personally. It means that the field is extraordinary. Like the Dalai Lama, I believe, a bit has that field. You know, when he stands in a, or a crowd of 50,000 people, and he says, you know, like, you know, we're all the same, we're all one human being. I'm a simple human being, just like you, I have two eyes and a nose. He said that one guy who was angry about the Dalai Lama, 
one reporter once in San Francisco, and Dalai gave a speech like that to about 5,000, and everybody was mind blown, you know, because they could feel this feeling of oneness, you know. But when the reporter was not into it, he was mad about something, about the Tibetans. So he said, and then the Dalai Lama said he had two eyes and a nose. He said, that was really brilliant. <laughs> he said, with wisdom like that, no wonder the Chinese took over their country. <laughs> You know, like, duh, we all got two eyes and one nose, you know. That's why, because he couldn't get the feel, you know. He was so bent and so incensed, you know. He couldn't feel the feel, poor guy, you know. <laughs> but, you know, it is funny. There are different ways people see things. <laughs>